R E A R E A R E A R E A Audio. Audio. Reemployability. Um, so you've met, brought up va- vaccinations. Obviously, the mm-hmm. vaccination debate isn't over. As of the recording of this, um, it was pretty recent that the Supreme Court said that companies could not, uh, companies with 100 employees or more did not necessarily need to mandate vaccinations as, as the government was trying to do. Where do you see that debate going? Do you feel like it's over or do you feel like it's going to be brought around again? And, and what are your thoughts on that? I think it's over. I also think that and when you're dealing in the medical profession, I think that's a very different standard um, because those professionals are required to take other vaccines. And so I can foresee that those hospitals, nursing homes, they may still require the vaccine um, because it's in the to the benefit or the greater good of not only the employees and the workforce, but also to the patients that they treat. Mm-hmm. I think that private employers have the right to mandate a vaccine. It's interesting. I was just on Yahoo News the other day, and um, I saw that there was a, an actress who lost a job because she didn't want to get vaccinated. Um, I think the the company that she was working for um, required vaccinations. And so she didn't want to do it. And so they said, okay, bye, we don't, we'll hire someone else. And she was upset. She kind of taken her fight to social media. Um, And one of the great things about living in America is you have your right, right? You have the right to do what you want to do, but you also have to deal with the consequences. And so in those situations, I think you're going to find some employers who are still saying, until this thing is under control, we feel as though vaccinations are the best way to protect our workforce um, and ensure that we have a healthy workforce. I think some employers are going to still do that. I think some employers are going to say, okay, we are going to encourage vaccinations, but we're not going to require it. Mm-hmm. Um, and and do that. I mean, just yesterday, I heard that the cruise lines were changing their um, COVID policies and COVID vaccination policies as well. So I think everyone is kind of adapting. I feel like we're coming out of the clouds. We're we're seeing a decline in COVID positive uh, cases, which is great. Mm-hmm. Right, it makes you feel a little bit better about life. Mm-hmm. Um, you feel like you can kind of get out a little bit more and see people you haven't seen. Um, and so I, I think that it's going to be an evolving thing as as it changes you know as we learn more as um we respond to different variants as we're exposed to different variants i think it's going to go through some changes until it's pretty much at bay and i mean i'm praying that that sooner rather than later right no no doubt um i actually saw an article in uh, risk and insurance, it actually came out yesterday, mm-hmm. having to do with mandate uh, vaccination mandates and legal rulings and and the influence on uh, EPLI. So of course, I had to look up what EPLI was because I'm not, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I haven't been in this industry for too too long. Um, so, do you have any thoughts on that? So there were employers that were um, prepared for the mandatory vaccinations. They uh, the ruling came down that said. Um, you don't have to. Uh, say someone comes and gets exposed at work and they can prove it. Uh, I mean, is that is that an issue that you foresee coming because an employer chose not to do that? Well, I'll have to play devil's advocate. Yeah. Uh, what happens to the person who is vaccinated who comes to work and gets exposed, right? You know, what we know is that the vaccine helps to save your life. But it doesn't mean that you won't get exposed and it doesn't mean you won't contract COVID. Mm -hmm. Just like getting the flu shot. You may get the flu shot, you may still get the flu, but the idea is you will recover quicker. And so um, I I can tell you, I suspect that people who are working at employers who don't get vaccinated, um, who aren't required to get vaccinated and they get exposed, they're going to feel as though their employer has not protected them. Mm Right. I mean, you have an expectation that you um, go to work and you're in a safe environment, be it safe from mold, safe from violence, um, you know, all of these things. You also want to be safe from exposure to harmful diseases. 
And so I think it's going to be a double-edged sword. I mean, you hear testimonials of doctors who say they have people who come in who aren't vaccinated and they're sick, 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 and they say, oh, I want the vaccine now and it's too late. Yeah. So I think it's, you're just going to see like a, a ebb and flow of how people mm -hmm. respond. I'm just hoping that people are, are safe and healthy. I mean, we have reached, I was just looking before you, before we connected today, we have 900 and, I wrote the number down, 908,000 people who've died of COVID in the United States alone, mm -hmm. 5.76 million worldwide. Yeah, it's a lot. That's scary. In two mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. I mean, this isn't like, <laughs> this is two years, Yeah. Um, but you have 212 million in America who are vaccinated. That's huge. I mean, that's mm -hmm. 60 plus percent. So I think for the most part, people are making some decisions that have been, that have been working for us. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know about you in March of 2020, that was, I, I, in, I had no idea that in February of 2022, we were still going to be talking about this. Oh my it's gosh. Definitely I mean, been crazy. It's right? been crazy. I, feel, I remember feeling like, can we all just stay in our houses for a month? Just stay in your house for a month. No grocery shopping, no, no trash pickup. Just stay in yeah. your house for a month and it, it should die. It should, it should go away. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can't do that realistically right. in, in life, but I just felt like we could be done with this by summer. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I know. And it feel I, I think a lot of people are frustrated because it feels like we just keep kicking the can down the road. Like we think it's going to be a month. That's what I originally thought. And then then it was going to be six months. Then now it's a year. And and so I think we're all ready for it as long as we all do uh, wh what the right thing is for us. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so it's funny that we talk about expectations, right? So as I mentioned earlier on, we last, first time we spoke was one of the first podcasts we did. I'm interested to know, like, in the past two years, what have you learned as an attorney that you think is going to help you moving down the road, right? This has been a horrific thing these past couple of years for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. I always like to try to find a bright side and it, as corny as that sounds, it's true. I feel like there's lessons to be learned in everything that happens to us. What sort of things have you learned that you feel like you're going to be able to utilize moving forward that's going to benefit people over these past couple of years? Okay, so um, the first thing for COVID that COVID taught me as a practitioner was um, to use our resources wisely, right? Use technology. And the use of technology can be a great thing because we were allowed to a great majority of the world to work remotely. And so we need to use technology and use our resources um, for the betterment of treating and helping injured workers and helping our employers get to a great place. And so first is to use, use your tools. Um, the second would be collaborative um, claims handling. When COVID hit, you had doctors who weren't doing well, um, who weren't doing um, some surgery, elective surgeries. You had um, injured workers who were afraid to go to doctor's offices uh, for treatment because they were afraid of exposure. You had um, doctors who weren't seeing patients in person. So you had the revitalization of telemedicine. And so in order for that to work, we all had to get on the phones. We had to talk to each other. You know, sometimes email wouldn't do. We really had to work collaboratively with all vendor partners and the injured worker and that person's attorney to make sure we were on the same page to get the injured worker better. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine having a person who was recommended for a surgery and the doctor says, hey, well, the governor says there's no elective surgery at this point. So you're kicking the can down the road for a couple of months. Yeah. So that person's maybe not able to work um, on some, you have some restrictions. So you have to, the injured, employ, the injured uh, I'm sorry, the employer care is having to pay a lost wages and so you're having that kind of buildup, and you have an injured worker who's saying I'm not getting any better I need my surgery I can't have my surgery and so being able to collaborate and have open lines of communication I think have really helped um and so I, I don't want to lose that that's that's kind of where I find my success with my claim handling is for it to be collaborative mm -hmm. I think that makes everything better um I think having a lot more compassion because you just don't know what people are dealing with, right? That injured worker is dealing with being injured, maybe loss of income. If they were the breadwinner for the family, that's impacting them from an emotional standpoint, I'm sure. Um, 
having to re rely on other people to help. So just having a little bit more compassion when you talk to people and when you're handling their cases um, and not just rubber stamping them thinking it's just like the last case because every case really is very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we had... We had uh, Dr. Claire Musselman on a couple of weeks mm -hmm. ago, um, you know, Claire, and uh, that was one of the things that she highlighted to us is that, you know, this this work that we do really is almost like social work um, mm -hmm. because you're you're impacting people's lives. And we have to be really, really careful about not, like you said, rubber stamping things and, yeah. and trying to trying to kind of put yourselves in their shoes and, and try to figure out what it is that that they're going going through. Absolutely. For sure. Well, Yashika, um, once again, thank you so much for your time today. It's always so nice to talk to you. And if it's okay, I'd rather not wait six or seven months before we talk <laughs> again. So would you come on again down the line? Absolutely. Anytime you need me to, I'd love to. Great. And if anything legally pops up, we would love to hear from you intermittently as well, right? We don't have okay. to have something. So, you know, I know things sometimes in your world and what your focus is, is a little different than, than ours. Um, anything that you think is important, it, it, you are always welcome to come talk. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'll take you up on that. All right. Absolutely. Thanks, Ashika. Buy or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also check out more content at listen to rea.com. Next week, we'll continue our discussion with Yashika, learning more about what she sees as important issues in the year to come. Thanks for being with us and have an awesome and impactful rest of your day.